Thank you everyone for joining us on the, uh, on the panel to discuss energy transition initiative and deep decarbonization. We have with us an amazing group of um, uh, panelists that will talk about different um, topics very relevant to the decarbonization efforts going on in the world today, and specifically in our hemisphere. So we will have discussions on um, technology at the regional level, at the country level, and at the community level on, on how um, the efforts are being um, are underway. Um, first, we have with us, I'm going to introduce the panelists. We have with us uh, Dr. Patricia Hidalgo Gonzalez. Is a, she's assistant professor at the Jacob School of Engineering at UCSD, University of California, San Diego. I will not go over uh, everyone's bios um, because of timing, but you are welcome to see, and I encourage you to see the bios um, on, on the platform and, um, and on the website as well um, because of their impressive uh, backgrounds. Um, also, we have with us um, Mr. Alfonso Blanco Bonilla. He's uh, the Executive Secretary of the Latin American Energy Organization, known as OLADE. And he will be talking about uh, regional uh, efforts. Guillermo Kutogian uh, is the Interim Director of, the, of Integration, Access, and Energy Security at OLADE as well. And uh, he will um, stay with us uh, answering questions more specific uh, to the region. We also have Pablo Tello, his uh, technical advisor for decarbonization, the decarbonization project in Chile. And he's with GIZ Chile. So he's going to tell us about what's going on in Chile, what uh, Chile is doing, their goals um, in efforts, and what specifically. Uh, the project that he's working on is about. And we also have Nicole Capretz. She is the founder and CEO of Climate Action Campaign. And this is something very unique um, in our uh, medium because uh, the, uh, the Institute of the Americas, we talk globally, we talk regionally, but now Nicole is going to bring us a different flavor. And that is the amazing power of communities, grassroots level. Uh, people, neighbors, uh, young people, high schoolers, what's going on and how they're really um, in California are, 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 are very empowering and uh, pushing forward decarbonization in a meaningful way. So we are very excited um, and uh, we want to start right away. So Patricia, we will start with you. Um, tell us from your perspective, technology, are we realistic in believing that decarbonization can happen technologically speaking? Is that possible or are we just dreaming? It's definitely possible. Um, so lucky for us, we have a wide range of technologies that are commercially available today and we have been deploying them worldwide for many decades now. To your example, like the obvious ones are like wind and solar power, especially with solar power, as we've seen the cost declines over 90% in the last 10 years. So it, it's only looking more promising and, and technically those are mature technologies that we have proven to work. Um, that being said, there's still open challenges that we need to address as engineers and policymakers and communities as well. Uh, from the modeling perspective, we're getting to a point where we're starting to look at different regions, how we're going to get to a fully decarbonized economy and power grid uh, as well. So now, Back, so I'm in power system sector, so there we usually look at how can we operate the grid as we get closer to zero emissions. So that has its own challenges related to uncertainty and how you're going to balance supply and demand at every time. But then there's the other aspect of it that there might be some low hanging fruits that we need to start thinking more holistically as we're looking at the economy. So looking at um, benefits or coordination that could happen across different sectors. Uh, and one example that's very much discussed nowadays is the role that hydrogen could play, given that it could support our power grid, but it could also support transportation, which is one of the largest um, sectors with emissions that we have nowadays. 
So we do have technological options commercially available. Some are more uh, like newer. We still need to see some cost declines for hydrogen, but we definitely have uh, wide options to keep moving forward and one day get to zero emissions. Um, but as engineers in particular, we need to continue bringing to light uh, what are the challenges and what are the new ways in which we need to operate our system, in particular the power grid, which is where I'm coming from, uh, as we have these new technologies in place. Uh, and, and I could go into more technical details if, if you're interested, but for now I'll keep it as we have the technology, we have the tools, we have the modeling tools, we need to further into a few aspects. Uh, when we're looking at seasonal uh, variability of the resource, seasonal storage, if, if we're moving into that direction, also real-time operation of renewables, not just from the variability perspective, but also the physics of the grid change as we have inverter connected devices. That brings a whole new set of challenges that we need to be mindful of to keep our frequency and voltages within the safety sets. Um, but yeah, I'll be happy to expand more on those uh, later if it becomes relevant. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, it's very helpful. Um, Alfonso, I'm gonna now give you the mic and, and if you can tell us what's going on in Latin America. Um, is Latin America catching on to this? Are they moving forward? Um, what do they need to do? Well, I, I always uh, start my, my interventions with the, the uh, what is the, the, the actual situation of, uh, of Latin America and the, and the Caribbean. And uh, I have to say that uh, Latin America has 30% percent of uh, re renewable energies in the primary energy uh, offer uh, in, the, uh, in the region. And if we compare the situation of Latin America regarding, re regarding re renewability in comparison with the rest of the world, that is 13%, 13 we are starting in a good position regarding re renewability. What is the, 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 the situation uh, about, about the re renewability? The renewability is part of the history of the Latin America because uh, Latin America has a very important uh, development in hydropower and, and, bio, and biofuels as part of the, uh, of the uh, uh, energy energy sector. Additionally, Latin America has very low participation of uh, coal in the uh, power power generation in comparison with uh, the rest the rest of the world. And and that is a, a very good uh, position in a, if we consider the low emissions and the participation of the emissions of Latin America in the in, in the Caribbean in the Caribbean in, uh, in the global emissions. We have only 5% of the global global emissions of a green, greenhouse uh, gases. Uh, in, and we are decreasing that uh, that uh, emissions in in, in comparison and uh, in percentage in comparison with the with the rest of the world. But uh, our region is at is at, uh, in a very important advance in the incorporation of the carbonization for, uh, policies, and we have very important uh, initiatives and, pla and platforms in, in order to increase the. Uh, the decarbonization. One of one of the, uh, of that is the RELAC initiative. We are working in the in the region in order to increase the uh, participation of renewables in the power generation from 60 percent. That is the actual uh, percentage of uh, power generation from renewables in the in the region up to 70 percent in 2030. That is an important uh, political political uh, commitment in in order to uh, to advance in the decarbonization uh, process of our our region. Additionally, most of uh, the countries are sinking in uh, in uh, energy carriers that uh, like hydrogen because our region has very important conditions for hydrogen production in uh, with low cost pro production last week i was in argentina argentina is working in a hydrogen in hydrogen production in uh, in uh, jujuy in uh, santa in santa cruz with very important uh, projects uh, chile is running is running projects uh, 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 on hydrogen uruguay has a 
hydrogen as a strategy. Colombia is working on a strategy of uh, hydrogen. Panama it will we will be part of the hub of the hydrogen hydrogen in the uh, around around the the world. There are other countries that are uh, establishing the uh, the policies for net zero in the in the, uh, up to 2050 and uh, like, uh, countries like, like like chile costa rica uh, uruguay presented their uh, commitment in uh, net zero net zero strategies and most of the countries are working in the uh, in second phase of their ndc's for decarbonization and uh, the commitment with with the Paris Agreement, the, the decarbonization is part of the discussion in the in the region. Most of the countries has uh, this uh, this uh, issue in their in their particular agenda. Uh, but we have to talk about and about energy transitions uh, because each country has their own path to uh, decarbonize their economies. That depends on a lot of uh, aspects. One of them is the uh, availability of uh, energy energy sources in the in, in the region. It's completely different to talk with uh, countries that are net importers of uh, of uh, oil oil in the region than uh, the the conversation co conversation with oil producers in the in the region and. Uh, uh, to finalize my intervention, I have to talk about the role of a, a low emission emission, uh, emission fossil, fossil fuels in the uh, in the carbonizing some specific uh, uh, sectors of uh, of the economy. The role of natural natural gas for the carbonizing in a in a uh, in a short period of time, some part some part of the uh, energy energy consumption in the in the region in the substitution of uh, uh, liquid liquid fossil fuels, for example, for example, in the uh, power power generation is a, an important opportunity with a long uh, short term short term uh, uh, results. We are talking a lot, a, a lot about the long-term actions for the, the, the for the decarbonization, but we have a lot of opportunities right now in order in order to decarbonize our uh, economies, to decarbonize uh, part of the uh, uh, high emissions emission sector like the transport transport sector, like the uh, uh, some uh, high intensive industries. In industries and uh, that uh, that is an important challenge for uh, for the Latin American region. Thank you so much. You're right. Latin America does have a very decarbonized electric sector, electricity sector, but there's other things that you need to do, like transport, right, and uh, uh, agriculture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so now we go to uh, a country level. Chile has been a leader in Latin America in renewable energy and has been very aggressive on um, hydrogen. And of course, it has a lot of uh, lithium deposits as well uh, that can be meaningful in the uh, um, race to decarbonize uh, transportation. So. Pablo, can you tell us what the country is doing and uh, give us a little bit of info on your project? Hi, Cecilia. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, hello, everyone there. Uh, of course, um, it has been a long time. Uh, I think um, maybe uh, we can think that it all started in 2003 five more or less when we have this um, this situation with the uh, Argentinian gas that we, we we stopped receiving it unfortunately at that time and so we had to build new um, generation capacity and that uh, and that capacity was uh, built for for coal unfortunately at that time so after the um, the construction of, of all that coal uh, capacity uh, in 2019, we, we had this um, amount of more than five giga 
uh, of uh, installed coal capacity in, the, in, the, in our country, which represent uh, around the 40% of uh, electricity, gener electricity generation. It was, a, a, it was a really, really huge problem for us because we are completely imported um, country of coal, gas, and um, all fossil fuels. So we, we, even we have so many good uh, renewable energy um, potential, uh, we have this this problem of decarbonization. So uh, we at JZ, at that time, we we um, we create uh, this project where I'm working right now, uh, which is called the decarbonization project for the um, Chilean energy matrix. And we are looking for um, support the government and the Ministry of Energy in order to find ways of uh, decarbonizing. But, uh, and, and this has maybe two levels. Um, of course, one, there is a one very political level uh, and there's another one more uh, in terms of technology. So from the perspective of pol political level, Chile, uh, by that time, 2018, 2019, uh, create this uh, like uh, working group uh, with all the coal um, production companies. So I mean, pro coal generation companies. So it was like four or five big companies in Chile that are, were generating in, in, with coal. And uh, the Ministry of Energy and JZ was was also working on that in um, in seeing or looking for some like real and voluntary um, decarbonization phases um, from the perspective uh, of uh, economic perspective and also because of political perspective because uh, we we had so many places and uh, small towns towns and um, sectors that were negatively impacted by the coal generation. You can see uh, we have like one very, very well known in the Tanas, also in Coronel, also Huasco, that is, uh, I mentioned in South, Central and North Chile. Uh, and all those communities were in, uh, negatively impacted by the, by the coal generation. Even all the, these plants has uh, the environmental permits for doing that. So uh, we saw that, and uh, by the by the uh, around the 2020 more or less, the, um, the, these companies uh, signed an agreement, a voluntary agreement of uh, phasing out the coal generation with uh, our, for about 28 power plants, um, and it started very well. But uh, you can say that um, in some in some terms, you know, uh, there are some some um, issues related of the voluntary because it's it's not like mandatory um, aspects. So there's a we we are still depending on as a country of the voluntary or if it's possible to do this and to to, to close the the power plants. Uh, in, depending on the on the on the on each company, more or less. Uh, it also, from the regulatory perspective, um, the Ministry of Energy and uh, the National Energy Commission creates um, a mechanism to have like uh, an standby, so to for paying the services of the coal plant uh, as an standby service. So those companies, uh, those power plants, receive uh, a payment. Uh, for being there in case of an emergency, and then they have to be noticed, of, of course, before that. Um, and from the perspective of, of technology perspective, uh, which is more my 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 issue right now, we uh, we have realized, as Jay said, that there were there has to be some solutions uh, in order to take advantage of what we have as an installed capacity. Uh, and, and and transform that capacity to a new use. And then we have been mm, doing with a com with some companies um, very serious detailed um, studies about how you can use, reutilize the power plant can, uh, power plant capacity of the coal, of course, uh, in a, and transform it um, 
not using coal, but using all the, the, the generators as in, in, a, in, a, um, in a solution that is called um, Carnot battery, which is uh, for the people who eat more, more like um, close to CSP, also so concentrated solar, solar, solar power generation is like all the, the part of uh, um, molten salts and the generation from molten salts put in place in a, in a coal power plant. Uh, and, and the molten salt will be uh, like melt by the electricity from re renewable energy uh, sources. Um, that is a new, that's a new, a new way of using the, the power plants, and it's a very good uh, also way to um, to reutilize the the asset that is already in, in place and is working, and and you can use it uh, without using car coal. Uh, as as and also um, you have already mentioned. So Alfonso mentioned, you mentioned, and also. I think Patricia mentioned hydrogen, and we are so so um, deeply involved in the in the in the national uh, hydrogen strategy and uh, working on those those issues as a solution also for the decarbonization of Chile. Thank you so much. A lot going on over there, and in, in I like the, the fact that you are looking at reusing dirty uh, plants. And, and turning them into a, 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 a clean um, energy production. I think that that's happening also with geothermal and uh, some oil fields even. Um, so in the, next we go to um, the community and uh, Nicole. Um, <laughs> I just sure. I, I lost I, you for a second. Um, so yeah, Nicole, tell us the, the power we it's kind of unseen nobody talks about that in these circles you know it's everything is federal level maybe california because it's so big but san diego so tell tell us what san diego is doing and, and how powerful that's uh, really being felt not only in california but uh, everywhere else in the united states mm -hmm. um well <clears throat> i've been in the political and public policy space uh for a little over 20 years and I started at the national level. And my first takeaway, you know, in, in Washington DC was uh, how removed the, the national politics is from the ground and the people and the community. And I just personally didn't like that, that there was kind of no uh, tactile connection and really just no voice from the community that was giving um, sort of the reality of people's experiences on the ground and their stories. But as importantly, it was clear that if you don't have people on the ground who are kind of making that consistent push and um, requirement friendly that their elected officials pass bold policies, it's really hard to make transformation happen. And regardless of the technology, regardless of you know people in the field who uh, acknowledge that they're better in different ways, you you need that ground that grassroots and groundswell of the um, lived experience, again, of community members, in my experience, to really get elected officials moving and, and frankly, feeling empowered because I've worked for three different elected officials now and they all share a very common denominator, which is they don't lead, they follow. There's really an overarching principle I, I live by as an outside advocate and when I was on the inside is that you really have to, again, build that grassroots support and let the elected official know that they're not going too far out ahead of where the community is, right? And they don't really know, they're not really sure. So it's up to um, organizations like mine who organize and build coalitions to let the elected official know like this is, you're you're in the right you know space um, so that they feel like they can do things outside of their comfort zone. But what, what happened in San Diego is that uh, as I was working for the mayor of San Diego, I was able to develop a, a kind of groundbreaking climate action plan that had this goal and a legally binding goal of 100% clean electricity by 2035. And so needless to say, everybody at the state and everybody across the country is like, that's cute. That's a good ambitious goal. It'll never happen. And, you know, we, and I had to get the mayor comfortable, needless to say, that this was outside of his comfort zone. This was outside of what sort of he was hearing was possible. 
And uh, nonetheless, he supported it. And then, you know, the next mayor supported it. We And what we did, and then I went on the outside, I left City Hall and went on the outside and really built that base of community members throughout all the sectors and um, throughout all all corners of San Diego to say, this is something that we really want to happen. Don't water it down. Like, let's, let's be the model. Let's push the envelope. Let's really tell the market like where we're at, where we want to be. And so we were successful. We, it took about a year for the mayor. And there was a new mayor that came in who was a Republican who came in and was obviously even less comfortable than the previous mayor who was more progressive with this idea of, um, okay, can we, wh- how can we do this? We are run by a monopoly utility, you know, who's regulated by the state. How can the city of San Diego actually break the mold and design a hundred percent clean electricity, um, grid? <clears throat> so we paired that goal of hundred percent with this new, you know, California, uh, allowed program called community choice energy where you're really sort of flipping the switch and flipping the model and having the community in charge of their electricity choices. And that took about five years. But after we passed this and got and built the political will and the community voices to support 100% clean electricity and more and more elected officials started embracing it. They started running on it. It became part of their platform. It became something they were proud of, you know, badge of honor. They went to higher office with it. Um, That uh, we then had to spend a lot of time building the community support again for really uh, radically changing how electricity is not delivered, but how it's procured. And so that's how we started San Diego Community Power, which is how you get to 100% clean electricity because they're not, they're still, they're still regulated under the Public Utilities Commission in the state of California, but they have uh, a lot more autonomy and they can not only procure 100% clean electricity, but they can set the price. And they can also, I think kind of the most exciting part of the program is that they get to reinvest the revenue back into the community. Whereas with the traditional utility model, the utilities are like, that revenue is for our shareholders. This is not a shareholder driven model, it's a community driven model. So it just really is kind of reinventing what's possible. And so it's, it wasn't just reinventing what's possible in terms of who's making decisions and where decisions are made and who's making decisions, but who's benefiting. And I think, it, you know, in listening to um, the previous speakers, um, it seems to me like the only way forward is to go from the ground up, is to start with the local regional level, building the public support for, you know, radically reimagining what's possible. And then pushing the elected officials, you know, at the local level to the regional, to the state, to the national, to sort of think outside the box. And the example that we have in being successful that way is that once the city of San Diego, which is the eighth largest city in the country, um, adopted 100% clean electricity, even though, again, in the in the academic world, in the utility world, everyone's like, ah, it'll never happen, you know, blah, blah. Um, uh, what happened is that then all the other big city mayors of the top 10 cities in the United States, they they get, there's a friendly or not so friendly competition amongst all the mayors. Um, you know, Chicago, Boston, LA, New York, they all watch each other, right? Top 10 cities, they're massive populations. They all have higher ambitions, <laughs> needless to say. They probably all think they're going to be president. I mean, I'm not even kidding. Uh, so you play into that and they start, they all started saying as soon as San Diego's did it, they're like, wait, sleepy San Diego what's what's happening because we were really we were the first city in the country to say we were going to do this and suddenly all these other mayors start you know raising their hand we're going to get 100% renewable electricity you know and it, it became this ripple effect and I think that's why I really truly believe in kind of the ground up it just really became kind of uh, attractive. And then we had the state of California. The state officials are like, wait, what? These big city mayors, they can't get ahead of us. I'm going to be the president. So then the state of California uh, assembly members and senators were like, no, this we forget San Diego. We're going to, the state of California is going to get to 100%. And then the state of California did pass that 100% clean electricity law. It's it's not, yeah, it's carbon free, I think. It's, it's a little more nuanced than 100% renewables. But then all these other states, Hawaii, New York, started saying, wait a minute, California, no, no, no. And then they, again, this ripple effect, this competition amongst first cities, then um, states, 
And then uh, at the national level, you probably know that our current president has embraced also 100% clean electricity for by 2035. Now, this, of course, it's very complicated and it's going to be, you know, it, it's not talked about as openly anymore. But I think the point is, where did it start? Where did the momentum begin? And who drove it? It was definitely not top down. It was 100% bottom up. So again, it's it's going to be a long pathway to 100% clean electricity, but Biden talks about it. And for the activists like me who started this movement in, again, sleepy San Diego in 2013, to have the president of the United States literally embrace the exact same goal of 100% clean electricity by 2035 is wild, is wild. And so, you know, we really lean on that as a model like this you know we really can create that you, you can not only kind of be bolder at the local level and innovate and experiment in a different way and and a lot of a lot of climate leaders at the un would say the same thing that that's you kind of need to use the opportunities at the smaller scale to you know figure out best practices you know leave take the best leave the rest and then you want to scale and export it like you just have more the luxury really at the smaller scale than you do at the bigger scale there's less at stake and you have you know again you just are, are uh showing what's possible but that's um so that's the model we continue to pursue with you know there's so many sectors to decarbonize right so we, we my organization does and now we're in two counties in california but we sort of say let's just like let's let's push like there's no there's no reason not to and at the same time let's make sure the community is there with us because the minute the community starts opposing is when the elected start walking back you know their commitments or they you know they start getting afraid so our job as a outside nonprofit ngo is to just make sure the community is still educated aware and talking to the elected and saying yes do that we want you to do this we have your back so that's kind of um, uh, how my organization approaches things. And my, my final comment would be the, the other voices that I think are getting elevated and I think it's pivotal are the people, the community members on the front lines, the community members who actually live next to the oil refineries, the community members who actually live next to the power plants or the ports and are bearing the brunt of all this. It's not just climate pollution, it's air pollution. And that air pollution, as many academics and scientists have you know, are now screaming from the rooftops it is killing people, literally. So it's, and so again, separate and apart from kind of this, the climate emergency that we're in, that just, you know, kind of, we look at the long game, air pollution is killing people today. So it's like, there's, when they tell their stories and explain, you know, the asthma and the respiratory illness that they and their kids are, are experiencing, I think it also helps the electeds understand the urgency of the issue. And like, this is not, it's not just an academic exercise. It's not just it's not just about creating uh, money for Wall Street. It's also about public health, and it's also about people's uh, up, you know, pollution also can uh, slow down uh, uh, intellectual growth, and so it's like it's hindering people from becoming you know uh, achieving their full potential. There's just so many negative externalities that don't often get talked about, especially. And kind of again the technology space or the academic space, but that's why we, again we are really rooted in community because these people who are living this day to day have the best, most compelling stories, and we want to keep pushing their voices to the forefront. And I think that's again a, a big piece of um, really getting all of us to think bigger and bolder and understanding what's at stake. Excellent. So thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah, I was going to ask. It was that was going to be my my follow up quest, question on on the benefits um, that they're beyond just decarbonizing. Yeah, you know, getting rid. There, there's so many other benefits, and and I want you to think about that because I like to come back to you about all these other issues that in the city we're talking about in terms of employment, mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, 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 you know the 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 communities, the walkable communities, the the well being of. Yeah even food security, all these different yep. things. Yep. So thank you, Nicole. Um, I'm going to now kind of uh, get into a little bit of, a, of challenges um, um, at the regional level before I go to Patricia with another question um, on, on, on the technical uh, side. But 
Um, I'm not sure if uh, maybe um, Alfonso or, or um, Guillermo can answer this. And this has to do with the urgency of decarbonizing sooner, um, given the, uh, the global politics, you know, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, oil and gas markets. Um, we, we didn't talk about that, but, but we have been decarbonizing before this happened. So now that we are here, what is, um, how is Latin America responding and, and what is the opportunity there? Um, Alfonso? Yeah. If you, uh, yes, okay, uh, let's, let's talk about the, 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 the shock and crisis and crisis from the, uh, from the war and what, and what is the, the impact and what are the, the opportunities, the opportunities, uh, some opportunities that the, the, the region, the region has due to the uh, supply energy crisis uh, around, around the world. Uh, first of all, uh, there are, there are some uh, bad sign, sign, sign uh, uh, world signals uh, due to the, uh, the the world, one is uh, the uh, the decrease of the decarbonization process all around the world, because the consumption the consumption of coal had had increased uh, a lot during during the last period, and some produ uh, regional producers of coal now. Are, are selling selling coal for the rest for the rest of, of, of the world in a, a in a process of, of a bad bad situation regarding regarding the decarbonization because because the energy supply using using coal during during this year and due to the uh, the uh, Russia Ukraine Ukraine uh, crisis is is increasing in, increasing and that is part of the of, of the role of uh, uh, latin america the production of uh, coal from colombia for example is completely uh, uh, providing it's providing pro providing part of the demand in a part part of europe of uh, uh, coal for uh, electricity electricity production and that is a uh, a uh, uh, a very very important important issue to highlight. The other the other, the other issue is with very high uh, energy energy prices in the in in the region and with very high uh, oil oil prices uh, international oil oil price, uh, prices. The uh, there are some uh, resources in the in the region that are in conditions to start operation again. Uh, that uh, were uh, a little uh, uh, blocked during low low uh, oil, oil oil prices, and in that sense, our region has the possibility to increase the uh, pro the, the production for the international offer offer in uh, in oil in oil, oil and gas, and that is a, a result of the high 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 prices of. Uh, of oil in the in the in the region. Uh, one example: uh, when the oil prices in the, were uh, uh, lower than 40 40 dollars, some uh, resources in the in, in the region were not uh, uh, were, were not uh, possible to to uh, to produce, like uh, vaca muerta vaca muerta in Argentina other uh, other resources resources in the in the region and that, and that is a, an important an important impact that our region has and uh, a new opportunity to some extractive extractive uh, industries industries in the in, in the in the region but an additional uh, aspect that I, I have to highlight that is that with a high level uh, of the oil, oil prices, the uh, possibility of uh, renewable energies under uh, good conditions in, uh, uh, in the uh, 
in, uh, for, uh, uh, for the prices for the renewable energies are very competitive in the renewable energies in the, in, in, in the region due to the high, the high level of, uh, of uh, oil, oil prices. Additionally, I have to, to add that there's a, a, a very important in, in impact in the uh, local local market. Regional regional uh, uh, countries, our uh, our countries are uh, uh, having uh, important actions in order to to have a stabilized prices in the of the energy in the internal markets, and that is not. A particular problem of the Latin American, the Latin American region. All the world is in uh, is under the, the same the, the same problem, and we are moving uh, again to uh, some uh, specific subsidies or specific actions in order to stabilize the uh, the, uh, the the internal prices of uh, of uh, fossil fossil fuels and energy in the in, in the region, and that's are the uh, the the short term the short term uh, aspects that we have to to consider. In the long term, there's a lot of opportunities regarding re, regarding the uh, renewable the renewable energies and the role of the renewable energies in the development and the creation and the creation of. Uh, uh, new activities and uh, moving moving the the regional the regional uh, economies and the because the uh, for example for the production of uh, of uh, uh, hydrogen the the north of uh, of Chile has prices of less than 20 20 dollars per megawatt uh, hour to generate a uh, uh, electricity and in the south of uh, uh, for example argentina uh, the, the wind farms are operating with a 65 percent of capacity factor with very good conditions for for that and and that is a, a huge opportunity uh, for the development of, of the region uh, we consider uh, considering the uh, possibilities of a uh, uh, more developed market for uh, renewable energies and all the uh, decarbonizing uh, uh, technologies. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Patricia, in line with um, challenges, we want more renewables, uh, uh, their goals, 100% renewables. Nicole, thank you very much. <laughs> So now um, the issue is how we're going to get there realistically given reliability issues on the grid. And uh, I wanted to uh, ask you to address those issues in terms of the, the modeling challenges that exist. Could you explain that to us? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I agree that's a key question. The, the short answer is that we can do it. We just need to be proactive about it and mindful about the new controller designs that we need to put into place and new ancillary services we might require. Um, but I'll go by part. So when we start looking at the challenge of like one year, we have the seasonality aspect of renewables. We have uh, solar power decreasing a little bit during the winter, for example, and wind power having its own uh, seasonal patterns depending on the region. The same with hydropower, of course, we have seasonality associated to the winter, snow melt and, and so forth. So when we're looking at that on a grid that relies on only like zero emission technologies, we, we have that aspect. So we need to be able to learn or realize what technologies are going to come into place that will help us to arbitrage that uh, seasonality aspect that I was mentioning. So to give an example of that, uh, right now I'm working with my lab with the California Energy Commission, looking at what could be the role for long duration storage in the state and in the Western uh, US. So we get to zero emissions in a cost effective way and what type of duration, so meaning how many hours of continuous uh, injection from storage we would need to support our grid reliably. So some examples with the CSC that we've been discussing uh, that have brought the modeling challenges is that in the energy community, because these models are very complex in terms of the number of variables they have, the number of decisions that they need to make, the hourly resolution. So they take a lot of RAM and computing power. The community used to choose 
only a subset of days to represent the whole year. And with that, try to understand what could be our energy mix, let's say in 2050 or 2030 that we're looking at. Uh, but now that we're trying to understand what could be the role of seasonal storage, that approach of only choosing, let's say, 10 representative days to model an entire year is not valid anymore, because now we need to have the ability in our models to capture the option of if I want to charge my storage facility in January and I need to discharge it all the way in October, then our models need to be able to capture that. So now we're being pushed to model all 365 days of the year so we can understand that dynamic and, and how that would work in, in a realistic way of modeling the grid. So that definitely has brought computational challenges, but we, we have addressed them. And now we do model 365 days to truly understand the seasonal aspect of, of the grid and when we're looking at zero emissions period. Um, and part of the outcome from this is hoping now, so the CC is funding us to do the modeling work. So we understand from a simulation perspective how this could look like. But now they want to move into the shift of let's have demonstration pro uh, projects. So we're saying, so if, if we're looking at grids, for example, as in California, where we expect to have mostly solar power dominating our grid, given the good uh, resource that we have here, especially in the southern part of California, we, we are seeing that we need at least to have storage facilities between set, uh, six to 10 hours of duration. So that's a certain type of technology that we don't have deployed right now in the grid, but there are plenty of companies that are working in that. So the CEC wants to fund in their next solicitation worth, uh, I believe it was uh, $380 million to have this pilot project so they could see what technologies are the most promising for California and Western North America to support our grid as we're moving towards zero emissions. So they were asking us, how many hours of durations do we need to start seeing like pilot projects so we feel like more comfortable as we reach our goal in 2045? So we are saying, you definitely need to have something that has at least 10 hour duration. Uh, now the grid in the US has between two hour duration like batteries or four um, in some cases. And then of course we have pumped hydropower, but that's a, a different type of technology that I can definitely address, but that's more on the seasonal side, but it has geographical constraints that we cannot deploy everywhere. And in the US, we, it's said that we have deployed everything we could. However, there are people that are thinking of other ways in which we could still leverage that technology with new designs. Um, but I leave that out of, out of the question and looking more at what could be the roles of other technologies that we haven't tested yet. And then as we're moving towards this shift of 100% renewables or zero emissions grid, that they're not synonyms, but I'm just saying as if they are for now, um, we need to be looking at other type of durations. So in our simulations, we see if we are able to reach with R&D much lower cost targets for long duration storage, we could be seeing seasonal arbitrage where our uh, batteries or, or storage, more broadly speaking, will start charging and then discharge during our peak demand. So for California, that would be during our summer, or if we're looking at Western North America, that would be in the summer and in the winter as well because of the heating loads. So in that case, we, we are looking at like 400 hour duration storage. And those are technologies that we don't have right now uh, deployed other than pumped hydro that we have some uh, that definitely supports our grid substantially. So then the CEC is looking at, well, let, then let's put a solicitation. So then we can start understanding what companies are arising in this space that they could provide the support that we might need moving forward. Uh, so that's on the seasonal aspect of it. And now if we look at the real time operation, we have another set of uh, challenges in terms of modeling and actually operating the grid. So one aspect is keeping our operational variables within the safety set so we don't end up in a blackout scenario. Uh, and one of those key variables, it's frequency. So that frequency, when you know we plug at home, we have the 50 or 60 Hertz, depending on what country we are in. So that frequency, it's very important in the grid to stay within the safety set and depending on the region is how much you can deviate from those, let's say 50 Hertz that you're operating at. Uh, and then what's the relationship with renewable energy to that? So what happens is that in historically in the grids that we've had until we started incorporating more renewables, the way that the frequency would um, operate or how that frequency would change over time was very easy to control. And it would vary very minimally because of the physical characteristics of thermal power plants. They have this like inertia rotating that would support the grid in the frequency uh, when it would deviate. 
and frequency deviates whenever we're not able to exactly match our demand and supply. And it's really hard to predict our demand, of course, so there's always some like variability in our frequency. And when we were having mostly thermal power plants, even though we would have this small variability in our frequency, given the physical characteristics of them, it would be easy to kind of keep it within the, the safety bounds that frequency, unless something large would happen if, if a power plant would go offline or something in those lines. But now as we're moving towards more renewables, this is changing. It's changing the basically the differential equations that govern the behavior of that frequency. So without getting too much into the technical side, what it means is that now, whenever we have a mismatch in supply and demand, yeah, our frequency can deviate a little bit faster. So from that faster deviation, it could lead us to a critical point where we're saying, okay, we're going below our safety set for the frequency. So we need to bring it back quickly. And as we have more renewables, these dynamics of the frequency are a little bit faster. So even though that's a new um, engineering challenge, we, we do have answers and the community has been actively working on this on how now we can have our inverters that are uh, based on power electronics now facilitate bringing our frequency back to the nominal point. Uh, and given that it's not a mechanical system anymore, but we're moving towards solar panels that are connected through an inverter that have power electronics, those are very easy to uh, control. They are very fast. So whenever we see a frequency deviation, we can have the power to also bring it back very quickly to the nominal point. So even though renewables were bringing this issue, frequency now can be a little more volatile. At the same time, they're bringing the answer. Now we have more controllability from power electronics versus with uh, thermal power plants, they have a lot of inertia. So it's really difficult and in some technologies impossible to make them shift their power injection from one point to the other. Uh, and the same with batteries. In terms of renewables, they are very quickly to respond and operate. So they can fully support as our frequency deviates to bring it back to the nominal point. Um, and in terms of understanding this like stability aspect of frequency and avoiding blackouts because of this, there's a lot more work that we still need to do as engineers. Uh, some examples that are really good are in, in islands, for example, in Hawaii has are moving towards 100% renewables. They don't have this backup that California has there. I mean, they're an island, so they're alone with their own electricity grid. So they have to come up with control schemes that are quick enough so their grid is reliable and doesn't fall into a blackout. Uh, and I like to mention the Hawaiian example because opposed to other countries that have a high penetration of renewables, for like, for example, in Latin America, we have a lot of hydropower and that truly helps with this aspect of stability in our frequency. Uh, the same with other countries uh, like Norway, for example, they also have a big proportion of hydropower but Hawaii, uh, it's a much smaller scale, so they don't have that benefit. So they're mostly looking into solar power. So they're looking into solutions and we're seeing that it is possible, but we need to be very proactive, especially with our grid codes. Like what are going to be the requirements that we have to put in place in the grid? So every new generator that we bring online can actually help us support, uh, operate the grid in a stable way. Um, and the other aspect that it's a challenge for modeling, um, but also socially that I wanted to bring up. Uh, and I'm so glad to be meeting Nicole today because I think it has a big component on the community. It's a management of distributed energy resources. So that's a huge part that could play a big role in decarbonization, especially like uh, for more context in California, we have um, a high proportion of solar power and 30% of it comes from distributed energy resources even though deploying roofs of PV, it's a lot more expensive than putting like a solar utility power plant, like in the desert, for instance. But despite that economic difference, people are interested in investing in this. There are programs, there's the interest to have this like local clean energy. So that's driving, having more distributed energy resources. And when we're looking into that, there are benefits that people can see right then at their homes, because then if they can self-generate their electricity instead of having to pay the bill to the utility, there's definitely an incentive for that. And as costs have been declining, this gets more and more convenient for them. Uh, and taking it one step farther with FERC in 2020, passing that ruling FERC 22-22, where they basically said that now to participate in the wholesale electricity market before you only had to be a power plant. So basically a big investor owning a power plant, but now distributed energy resources are allowed to bid into the wholesale electricity market. So that's a huge game changer for them. But what's stopping us from truly uh, tapping into that opportunity 
is having the market reform at the local level. We have a utility in between, and of course they have to help continue operating the distribution network in a safe way, but we also need to start seeing these changes that we need more in the you know, local neighborhoods, cities, states, and so forth, so then these communities can actually participate with the solar PVs that they might have on the roofs, and then not only serve their own electricity, but start injecting electricity when they have excess, and especially as they can help the grid to be more reliable. And one really big example that sadly we've seen in California so much over the last five years, it's the wildfire season. So now this is a reality. We're facing this. Unfortunately, climate change got too far and we're doing our best, but uh, now we need to come up with a strategy how we're going to operate our grid. Uh, what, what is mind blowing to me is California. If we think of it as an independent region, it would be, I think the top five in terms of uh, GDP worldwide. So we are very rich. And how come we're having blackouts? It's something that it's hard for me to understand and, and accept because we definitely have the, the intelligent people working here. We have the resources. It's a matter of redesigning this and putting it into action. So bringing that back to distributed energy resources, whenever, if we're at a risk of wildfire and we need to shut down a certain power line, then if we would have the capacity to locally generate our electricity, we would avoid so much stress and, and loss of millions of dollars that we've been having. So looking into how we could have the state have regulations and incentives so we could make that happen. It's a big part of, of what I'm interested in. And in my lab, we work on different algorithms to now operate these distributed energy resources, how we could coordinate a set of like neighbors and how have them make the most out of their resources, not only to serve locally, but then to support the grid. And this aspect of local neighborhoods to support the grid is something that is unexplored yet in terms of regulation, and, and we need to move in that direction if we want to take this more seriously. Um, and some examples of that, it's as Nicole was saying, it's really important to test it in a small scale, so then you remove risk and people feel more comfortable. Um, and at UCSD, we have this huge microgrid that powers, I believe, 90% of the load that we have at UCSD, and it's around, I think, 50 megawatts. So it's almost like a small city, just a university. So with that, uh, we're trying to understand how we could manage these DRs, what's safe, what can we do to support the grid in terms of frequency regulation and other questions. Uh, and luckily, the federal government has shown interest in this, and they've just now funded uh, extra $40 million to now expand the operation of the microgrid. So we have a lot of opportunities to bring these engineering solutions, test them out, and then move forward the conversation in terms of policy and regulation. Um, so, Nicole, if, if I may add a question towards the end, I was wondering if you work with communities in that aspect, because I'm super interested that this doesn't stay in academia and we push it forward, because we're, we're, we have found ways in which we could operate our like PV panels in a way that people can get the most out of it, and we can even reduce the cost of the distribution network, and now we need to keep bring the utility on board as well. So, there, there's a lot that we need to do. Yeah. Can I comment real quick, Cecilia? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. I was, I'm, I love that whole, I was hanging on every word because um, we kind of knew is if we put the hundred percent clean electricity goal out there, you, you and many others would figure out how <laughs> it can happen. And of course, but to your point, it's not just about the engineering and the technology, it's also about the policy and the regulations. And that's kind of where we can come in. And that's what I meant about how you sort of need the community as a hedge against the status quo, because I don't probably need to tell anybody on this conversation, the fossil fuel industry has very powerful and have their own point of view about what the future should look like, as do you know, institutions like these um, vertical monopoly utilities and they're, Re, it's really they're really entrenched and they have regulatory capture and it's really hard to push back but that's what the community is so brilliant at and that's what they they are doing right now with rooftop solar as um as you probably know because the the utility and the utilities have been pushing for years to stop rooftop solar because that's a threat to their business model and their profits uh they prefer the large grid and the you know um building more infrastructure because that's where they get that guaranteed rate of return and they want to put it all out in the desert but now we're seeing that that's just not compatible with the climate um, realities that we're experiencing. And so, yes, we need a more distributed microgrid type solution. Um, so yeah, we uh, the, the place that I would love for you to get involved, just so you know, is San Diego Community Power. 
that is our local utility. Now remember they're bifurcating the role. So San Diego Community Power just does the procurement, but they also have, like I said, they have program money. So they get to they get to have pilot projects, you know, now they have to convince SDG and E, you know, to kind of maybe help partner because they do still run the grid. But there is there's there's sort of a healthy tension between San Diego Community Power and SDG and E and there's some symbiotic you know, there's some synergy there. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for you at UCSD to work with San Diego Community Power to figure out how to bring more of these ideas and pilots and experiments into the community. And and because I was thinking, oh, it's great it's at UCSD, but that's a very confined campus. What you what we really have to awesome. crack that head of like, what do you do in regular neighborhoods where, mm -hmm. yeah, you have rooftop solar in some houses, not on others, you know, and then everyone has different incentives and motivations and it's not just a you can't just I know UCSD has that control room for the microgrid I've toured it mm -hmm. and it's like oh that's great you can automatically just turn down the air conditioner of every single building at UCSD so that's you know that's fantastic but we don't have that in the community mm -hmm. so but the point is you are you guys are learning in real time like how could we I love everything you're doing there to figure out how we can navigate a microgrid and then you know again how do we export it into um, neighborhoods uh, super exciting, but just so you know, I, I, Cecilia, I want to help com connect her to San Diego Community Power because I think they'd be thrilled to try to figure, to experiment and innovate on some of these ideas. Um, but again, I, yeah, I just um, really uh, can't stress enough how important it is that you have community NGOs uh, on the outside who are not only pushing the electeds, but pushing back on the regulators, mm -hmm. you know. And like that is such a hedge against status quo. And there's just no replacing that. I mean, we need everybody. So the ecosystem's obviously robust and everybody on this call is pivotal to that ecosystem. But please don't forget the role of the advocates and activists who are really kind of helping ensure that the regular, regulators stay honest and the elected officials stay honest and the money that they're getting or you know, indirectly or directly from fossil fuel interests are not keeping us stuck because everything's on the line. I mean, literally our lives, like humanity is on the line. So we have to break the, that that um, political logjam that obviously we see at the national level still today. I mean, it's painful, very painful, how powerful. They have one Senator that is, you know, basically um, vetoing any kind of progress on clean, like, clean energy and not just clean electricity, clean energy in general. That's, that's, Unbelievable. That's that's uh, ugh, it's um, unbearable to think about when anybody who has kids in their life five or under. I mean, it's just I, I can't even think. It stresses me out just thinking about their future. So, anyhow, yes, you're doing I, the partnership would be great with the community and the academics. That's the bottom line. Yeah, thank you so much. No, and, and funny that you you ended there because um, also what uh, Patricia was talking about technology is there. You know, I think funding, I mean, Wall Street has, has more money than they can do, mm -hmm. they can do it. So it's not a lack of uh, funding. So what we need is political will, right? Yeah. Political um, uh, leadership. And, and Pablo, now I'm, I'm going with that question to you because you just had a change in precedent. And, and I wonder, you know, for some of us who are not keeping close attention to what's going on, how is that? Um, shift happening? Can you see um, decarbonization uh, getting even better? Or maybe there's a pushback? What did you see? And also, if you can also talk a little bit about um, the challenge, because I'm, I'm talking challenges here, that the challenge that Patricia was mentioning with um, what we need long um, duration storage and in your work with hydrogen there. Yeah. Mm. Okay, uh, tricky question about the change of president. <laughs> I, I will explain. Um, do the, the war, uh, what um, Alfonso mentioned, and also maybe Guillermo is going to, to mention as well. Or, um, we are having had some troubles with um, energy supply and, uh, and gas. Uh, and that, uh, and also because of uh, lack of water, because of climate change, we have been, re been seeing re reducing our hydropower generation in the last, I think, 10 years, or even more, maybe. Unfortunately, we have, uh, we, but 
10 years ago, we didn't have this kind of pro troubles, but nowadays we are, yeah, we are struggling with uh, all of type of uh, problems. Um, and uh, that means that, uh, for instance, that one, one coal power generation unit was, uh, that it was planned to be closed by three, three days ago, I mean, May, May to, to 2022. Uh, it was not um, uh, planned to close, uh, and the National Energy Commission asked them to still open generating with power with uh, coal because of, uh, we don't have um, so much uh, generation power capacity. I mean, uh, steady power capacity, not not renewable. So in terms of that, and what uh, may, maybe Patricia mentioned. Um, we, we identify all these kind of issues in, in this project we are working on right now. So we one of uh, our output is uh, renewable energy integration in the in the more like wide way. So we are looking uh, there different ways of uh, in for helping the renewable energy generation to increase the the, um, the amount of energy we can generate with them. Um, and that has, of course, some um, maybe regulations uh, issues. Um, we have to adjust and work together with, with the Ministry of Energy, with the National Energy Commission, and also with the generators in order to find ways of um, to, to expand the generation of electricity uh, from renewable energy sources, uh, but under new regulations, because sometimes you have maybe ancillary services you can you can provide with it renewable energy or for instance with inverters and nowadays our market is not so um, developed in that way we have already an, an, an ancillary service market but it's very very in the in first step steps so um, we have to like work in in that uh, in that sense helping the generation from renewables um, and uh, of, uh, in, in relation to that, we, we and also what uh, is mentioned, um, some, some, some uh, commitment were said, so the last year about the, the, the carbonization, because there was a pressure, a political pressure uh, in order to close all the coal, coal uh, power plants by the 2030. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a very complicated situation because yes, all we, we, we want to close them because there are so many people damaged by the way they call, I mean, I mean, really damaged. So, um, the quality of life, they cannot live there. There are some people even dead because of, uh, of, the, of the, of the impacts of negative impacts of coal. So local communities, um, but for in the in the other hand, you you want energy. All the people want energy. So with, with the pandemic, with the pandemic, uh, the energy consumption curve uh, change, <laughs> and all the parameters and, and the hours of the day that you, we um, we need more electricity change also. And um, and we have to do something with that as well. So we have to find a solution. Uh, which is not very, very, um, very easy. We can have, of course, we, we do have gas, um, and Alfonso mentioned that, that maybe the gas can be um, like uh, a starting point. From, from my perspective, the gas is not, is not a solution. We, as a Chile, for, as a country, we have to import even the gas, so it's not, it's not a sustainable uh, solution. You can reduce the half of CO2 emissions, but you're still having uh, emission, CO2 emissions, and you're still having the problem of uh, uncertainty of the prices. Uh, and even, even we have also another problem with uh, gas generation in Chile. Um, so what I, uh, one solution, I, I saw one, one, one question there, what is about the interconnectivity and the interconnection with another countries uh, is, is really a like more technical solution. Um, but of course, we are not very used to, to have an interconnection. So, so to just to give electricity to the Argentina, I, um, I know that uh, nowadays there is a, a conversation between the Argentinian government and the Chilean government in order to 
uh, final agreement uh, in, in where Argentina can provide us gas, natural gas, more maybe for 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 thermic use. I mean, uh, energy for for houses, and we can provide Argentina electricity. And the challenge you you ask me in terms of um, interstationality. Uh, we faced that um, issue that in 2014 when we were working as Jay said with a renewable energy potential from from renewable energy sources. I mean sun, and and the, and the reason that um, we we started working in, in hydrogen it was because of that particularly. So we we saw and and there's um uh, there are several diagrams that show you that okay. Lithium batteries are for short term, uh, and if you need more like months uh, of energy um, um, accumulation, you need some some power tricks um, carrier, and one of them one one of uh, is uh, is hydrogen. It could be also uh, ammonia, or it could be also methanol or synthetic methanol, um, but yeah our main reason to be working in, in hydrogen since the 2014, so, so 2015 is because of that. And uh, and of course, we in Chile, what, what we do um, uh, right now, what we are, we are doing right now, is uh, goes in that way. So taking advantages of what we have in the North, uh, I think my perspective, very personal um, is we that we have to concentrate all the efforts to use the hydrogen we can pro produce in, in Chile for local uses. I mean, I mean to, to not we have to ex to 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 be focused on using that hydrogen in all what we can. I mean, of course, economically it's difficult, but in terms of energy security, in terms of um, also in uncertainties of prices of everything because energy so fuel fossil fuel affects all the economy so it affects inflation rates affects all transportation costs so if we can be independent of that as a country uh, not only Chile it's applied for every country that can provide uh, um, their their own like fuel or green fuel uh, which could be hydrogen. Um, it's very it's, it's it's a matter of security, local security, and also it can um, can fight this problem of um, inflation that is having is is, is is affecting right now all, all, all the, the whole world. So for us, it's a, um, I think it's a really really incredible benefit to have the sun and also the wind in south in south. Uh, and but but we have to focus all the, the solutions in, in local local for instance transport heavy duty transport I think Alfonso mentioned that or even Patricia uh, we can uh, and the hydrogen you maybe you have uh, hear about that hydrogen is like the way of uh, the carbon uh, of the carbonizing the the heavy duty not only the um, transport I mean trucks. But also maritime um, transportation and also even um, aviation. Uh, that is more difficult because we have to create these synthetic fuels. But based on, on hydrogen, you can do that. So uh, you can also you can also after um, some combinations, you can even reutilize the, um, the gas generator uh, generators uh, with hydrogen. For instance, um, Siemens and General Electric even are, are, are now producing or like manufacturing uh, gas hydrogen ready and gas turbines. So I mean, uh, so if you are so if you ask them uh, to have a, a, a turbine for a generator turbine for for ten years more or five years more, they will say you okay you can operate with the gas natural gas or you we will be able in five years more to operate it with a fully hydrogen or a mixed uh, blend. Um, and that is very interesting because it, it shows you that the hydrogen is uh, already set up at, uh, set up in the, in the mind of, of manufacturers.
of this um, CO, CO, CO2 like um, manufacturers that were before and now they are thinking in, in no more CO2 and uh, how to, to change or switch to uh, green, uh, green production uh, generation. So it's very, very, very important uh, to have that in mind uh, and the benefits of hydrogen. But mainly, mainly, I think I, we have to, to focus on local use. Uh, firstly, like in five years, so five years of local use, and then you, we can export. Of course, we, we will be able to export everything, a lot of uh, hydrogen or methane or even ammonia. Um, it's not clear right now. But uh, as a country, it, it's an advantage to, to use it uh, locally. Excellent. Thank you for your points. And, and it's really hopeful that you see that switch happening right now with the uh, uh, energy companies. That's really good. Um, I wanted to pick up on, uh, there was a question too from the viewers in the Q&A. Um, if you have a question, anybody uh, who's uh, online, you can um, post it on the on the chat, uh, the key, uh, the Q and A icon. So you kind of mentioned it a little bit, but it, uh, um, I have a question, maybe like for the Olade team, and that is um, the uh, cross border uh, interconnection. Um, it's that something that we can. Uh, what is going on it, it, that can be utilized? Um, and, and the question here was specifically about um, uh, intermittency, uh, overcoming intermittency by uh, cross-sharing uh, electricity. Uh, is that something that we can see in the Southern Cone happening anytime soon or relatively soon? Guillermo? Yes, well, thank you, Cecilia. Well, uh, I was I was looking at that question because that that's exactly what we are working here from Olade with the our colleagues of the the IDB, the International American uh, uh, Interdevelopment Bank, and with the with the countries of the Southern Cone. We are working on an initiative called CSUR, which is uh, uh, electricity interconnection for the Southern Cone, which involves Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil, and Chile, and. This was also mentioned by, 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 by Pablo. Uh, the idea is to not only to interconnect two markets, but the whole region, the whole sub-regional, the Southern Con. Because what we have seen until until to, to now, these days, is that there are good there are good relationships, a bilateral relationships among the countries, Paraguay with Argentina, Paraguay with Brazil, Uruguay with Argentina, Uruguay with Brazil. But we are still, we are lack of a, a sub-regional country, a market, I'm sorry, a sub-regional market. So when we trade electricity, those, that trade is bilateral. And we are trying to move forward, one big step forward to create a sort of sub-regional market and to try to uh, get, give more and uh, less, sorry, less uh, heavy or less burden to the, to the intermediate system. So if we have a, if we have a sub-regional market, for example, the surplus that we could find, for example, wind surplus that we could find in Uruguay or solar surplus that we could find in Chile, it could be trade using the electricity network in Argentina to other neighbors. But for that, we need a lot of regulatory framework change because the framework of the electricity markets in the South is still a framework that it is also always seeing the bilateral trade, so we need to move forward on that. But we are working on that, and the countries are are embarked in in this project. So, for that reason, I would say that this is is, is a good project, and it is not new in in, in Latin America and the Caribbean because we have the CEPAC market in the Central American uh, and the in the Central American region, and we also have the CINEA market which involves from Colombia to Peru and the electricity uh, regulation. What is new perhaps in, in, in CSUR in the southern corn is that the foreseen what, what the countries are foreseeing is not only an electricity market but also an energy integration market which could also include natural gas for the near term and after that hydrogen. 
One of the things that uh, Pablo mentioned and Alfonso also mentioned is that we have in the southern cone uh, infrastructure for natural gas, connecting infrastructure. For example, we have seven natural gas pipelines from Argentina to Chile. And when can we say that that could be becoming the next few years as a stranded asset? But if we develop an hydrogen market in Chile, in Argentina, there are countries that they have, Chile has a national strategy, Argentina is working on a roadmap. So if we will have that in the next few years, we could use those infrastructure that, that could be mentioned, for example, as a stranded asset, we could use them for trade hydrogen or for move hydrogen from the centers of production of those hydrogen to the ports for the export market. I concur with, with Pablo what you said that maybe we should appoint, or our countries should point first to a local market of hydrogen. There's a lot of hydrogen to be replaced for example, in heavy duty vehicles, in heavy industries, in, 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 in um, river transportation, not, ma not only maritime transportation, but also uh, fluvial river transportation. And uh, that is one of the, the main topics that we use the, the green hydrogen. There are also, of course, uh, there are also other strategies, for example, that the Panama one, that it, they put it on, on a hub to export, or the Colombian one. Um, Going to something that Alfonso said previously, and, and it was something about the, your, the question that you, you asked him that I would like to improve a little more, if, if, if I may, is about the, the countries and, and the decarbonization process regarding what is geopolitically now going on during in the world, uh, what is happening with Ukraine and the invasion of, of Russia, the, inv the Russian invasion of Ukraine. What we will have, or what we are going to have, I believe, in our region is a sort of a dual effect. In the first time, or in the near term, we do have some producing oil and gas producing countries that could benefit from this, from this uh, situation. For example, think about Venezuela, that maybe Venezuela could go again into the market with this kind of oil prices. And if there is a sort of I would say um, less uh, uh, re um, uh, regulators or less um, sanctions on the Venezuelan economy because of what is happening now in Europe, that could be a market that could perhaps get a revival. Think about Mexico, Ecuador, the, 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 Argentine, the Argentina, for example, Argentina is a net export of crude oil. So we have, that impact in the countries that they are producing that in the near term they could benefit from this context and in the long term of course we will have a lot of opportunities for making the transition the transitions as we uh, used to say in Olave because they are not only one transition there are many transitions regarding on the national circumstances of each country so we could move forward or we could move further to the transitions and, and more rapidly uh, but not only not in the in the near term, but in the medium and long term. So there's a complex scenario for a, for 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 a, for for our region in the in this case. But we are working with our countries to try to help them in in in, in moving into this way. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we're going to um, get into the um, issues of community impacts. Um, I asked Nicole to, to prepare something for uh, a question on, on how this is, is impacting the community. And I am uh, just uh, wondering here whether I should start with another question that just came in. Um, and it's about uh, not on the, on the positive side, but could be on the positive side. So maybe I'll start with that. And, and that would be for Pablo and Guillermo. And, and this has to do with the... Um, with the actions that, that are being taken for decarbonizing and, and the vulner, increasing vulnerability to populations and ecosystems. So it's, it's an issue, you know, with uh, when they, a power plant comes in, it has been an issue obviously with oil and gas in the uh, uh, tribal communities and, and rural communities. So how do you, 
how we how to manage the trade-offs. Um, if one of you can answer that, or maybe prepare the answer for that, while well, Nicole, who is fully prepared, can tell us um, the, the impacts to the community. And Nicole, you also did not mention the, the brand new um, movement that you got going there with the Green New Deal. But tell us the, you know, how all, everything that you, you've, uh, you've accomplished or you're moving towards is actually impacting the community beyond electricity. So you do want to start with me? Sorry, I thought you were saying. Yeah, I don't understand with you because I, oh, I'm, I'm black okay. them. So they, this is a new question, so I, right. I just want them to prepare. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. You're giving them time to think about their answer. Okay. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so when the city of San Diego developed their climate action plan for 100% clean electricity, it was system-wide, it was community-wide. So it wasn't just about the electricity sector, it was also about uh, emissions from transportation and from waste and from buildings, uh, which I think many people know is like a new, the new frontier is how do we get gas out of buildings? Because gas pipes are going to every single building, home, uh, industrial, commercial, um, everywhere. And that's a huge problem. Um, again, from a public health perspective, that's uh, what there's a lot of new studies and data out about how dangerous it is to actually have to burn gas in your home, especially in uh, on cooking on gas stoves. And it's, you know, a lot of people say, we'll look back in 20 years and say, how in the world did that ever happen that we thought it would be a good idea to have combustible pipes and, you know, underneath every community, especially with children around. Um, but so we have, there's, there's the immediate public health issue. And then there's the um, issue related to um, the methane leaks that everybody is also now quantifying and studying uh, from the gas pipes underneath the ground. But so we looked at in the climate action plan, like what are the um, possible ways for us to fully decarbonize the entire community? And I think what's the beautiful part about it is not the, the negative health impacts and quality of life impacts um, that we are all obviously very well aware of, but how can we transform our entire city? Again, if we are one of the top 10 cities in the United States, how can we transform our entire transportation system so that people actually have a choice about how they get around? Because right now, this is very, you know, again, focused on Southern California, there really isn't many choices, especially safe choices outside of a car. And so, you know, and this is not true everywhere. So this is very specific to Southern California, but we, you know, are very car centric, very sprawling in how we've grown and developed. So we have to transform everything about our transportation system. And we have a very um, aggressive plan to build world-class transit for the first time, which is crazy that we don't already have it by the way. So it's unfortunate, but nonetheless, that is part of our climate work is how do we provide um, world-class commuter rail, how do we have, um, how do we retrofit our existing streets so that they're not just, again, for cars and they're getting people as fast as possible from point A to point B, but we're actually mindful that we need more pedestrians and we need more, more people riding their bike or using other micro-mobility options. Um, and that, yes, of course, there, there will continue to be cars on the road, um, but how do we make it safe for all modes? And so that's going to require a huge investment in um, retrofitting our communities. And then, of course, like I said, how we grow and develop, we have to transform <laughs> our thinking away from single family and to, you know, multiple different housing types. It's, I don't know the housing situation in Latin America, but in the United States, it's grim and there's all sorts of ramifications of, of not having sufficient housing supply at different price points. Uh, and, you know, it's causing homeless crisis almost in every big city in America. But so that's part of the climate action plan too, is, you know, so it's, it's electricity, it's energy, it's land use, it's transportation, um, it's zero waste. It's like, how do we marry all of these things so that we are creating kind of the, the city that we actually deserve? And that will actually have cleaner air, have clean water, and have bikeable, walkable streets, um, and and really, you know, be, have more equity. Needless to say, and and so we're sort of moving away from building and expanding freeways and highways, and how do we use existing um, transportation infrastructure that we have to make it safer and more attractive, um, and 
uh, one of the incentives to get people to um, build differently and move around the city differently. So yeah, we are really looking at this from a larger lens. And so there is a lot of, but just like you see in the energy space, there's a lot of resistance from people who just, people just resist change. I mean, you know, it's hard for, that's humans. We just, we like our little, whatever um, routine we have, it's hard for us to break out of that uh, point of view and see that actually we could, again, reimagine what's possible. So started talking about what we are doing on the electricity mm -hmm. grid. And now we're trying to figure out how do we, again, figure out how to transform our streets, how to transform our waste collection, how to build differently. And of course, like I said at the beginning, how do we get um, totally remove fossil fuels from all parts of our um, city? And so we're not as in the in the climate action plan, there's not as much focus on industrial. So I can't, there's a whole separate segment on that. But and then of course I forgot to mention, yeah. of course, EVs and getting rid of diesel buses, because again, you look at the data on the air pollution. Um, it's not just from oil refineries and ports and power plants, it's these diesel heavy duty trucks that are just crushing uh communities that are on the front lines uh, of these freeways in terms of their pollution. So there's a big effort at the state to invest in retrofitting um, electric via retrofitting trucks and cars. So it's really, it's all of these things we're trying to work on all at once, but because all of them meet with resistance because they're all about change, they all need their own set of community members who are engaged and interested and sort of seeing what's possible and telling their elected officials it's okay. I just can't emphasize enough to me how much the political arm of this whole movement is essential to actually achieving what we all want to achieve. You can't get there without politics. You can't get there without organizing communities. You just can't. Because again, resistance to change and because of resistance that's mounted and funded by existing industries. You know, they're the only, like the best hedge, again, we have against fossil fuel money is just community voices. And so I, um, yeah, but, and so also finally, Cecilia, to your point, sorry about economics. That's the other piece is like, can we build a new green economy and create new green jobs? And how do we get people who've never had access to those jobs traditionally left out of being trained and um, having, uh, and people thinking about, yeah, we need to lift everybody up. And this is an opportunity because the fossil fuel economy was, is, you know, a certain segment of the community has access to those jobs. And they're obviously not even met, maybe they're very well paying, but I, we didn't even touch the, it, impact to the workers of burning fossil fuels if that's what they do every day um but yeah what are you know th that's another it's part of it everybody. yeah is the economic opportunities well, and getting new people to those opportunities thank you so much unfortunately we ran out of time actually we are a couple of minutes late so i oh, i'm so sorry i um we didn't get to all the questions and uh, uh that issue of communities i know is being dealt with and in, in different ways. And I hope that Olade and of course the Institute, we will be bringing that up and, and, and looking at it in more in depth. Thank you everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we are going to end shortly. So have a wonderful rest of your day. All right, thank you very much. Hi, thank you for the invitation.